Uh, starting with uh, part four, which is analysis for bending. So the purpose of this chapter is to be able to get our capacity of a concrete member under flexure and estimate a size, maybe rebars, select the proper size for a, uh, a member that can resist some flexural applied load. Now, the name of the chapter is Analysis for Bending for Singly Reinforced Rectangular Beams. What do you mean by singly reinforced? It means that it has only layer of steel, layer or layers of steel that is in the tension side. So this is the tension side, I will have steel. On the compression side, I will not have steel. I will only have concrete resisting with me. You got the idea? So the idea here is to say that if it's singly reinforced, that means I only have steel towards the tension side. I don't have it on the other side. Or if I have it on the other side, I'm really ignoring it because it will contribute to the strength, but it's ignored. Basic requirement of this chapter is to be able to estimate some capacity. This is the strength. We call it a capacity that is bigger than or equal to the demand, right? Now, are we going to be equal? Sometimes, but my main purpose is to either, from the demand, estimate a size that can give me a capacity that can hold it, or check safety, right? Sometimes you're just checking the safety of a structure for the applied load. Where do we get the MU from, or the MU max from? From regular analysis of structures. So looking at any beam, I have some bending moments like this. Where is my maximum moment? This will be my MU. Where my maximum moment is, this will be my MU. And then where do we get this from? From service loads that are multiplied by some factors, remember U. And developing bending moment diagrams, this is the bending moment diagram. And then picking the maximum factored moment, which will be the one required to find the flexural strength. What is phi mn? It is my flexural strength. This is my capacity. Where do I get the capacity from? Or what are my assumptions that I do to get the capacities? The assumptions, first one, is equilibrium. And we agreed on the equilibrium saying that all the forces will be equal to each other in opposite directions. So for bending, where do this come from? It simply comes from, if I have a simple beam subjected to both tension and compression, we agreed that above the neutral axis it will be compression, below it will be tension, then the tension in this steel will be equal to the compression applied into this concrete block up on top. Now what happens to the concrete over here? It will be under tension. And we said we will ignore it because we will assume that it's a cracked section. So we will, one of the assumptions we talked about in part two was that in the cracked part, in the tension part, we assume a crack is happening and concrete will not resist with me. So now what this part is saying is simply that the capital C equals to the capital T. What is C? It's the force, the compression force in concrete at the compression side. What is T? It's the tension force of the steel in the tension side. Both of these guys together will make a moment. That moment is what we will equate with the applied moment to the section. How the moment on this comes, or where does it come from? It is simply N of them times the distance. C or T times the distance between them. The second one that is very important is the compatibility of strains. What is compatibility of strains? Simply we said that for any section that has some neutral axis here, my strain will be assumed to be a straight line, a straight line that passes through the centroid or the neutral axis. So this here is the condition of compatibility of strains. Remember 
that we said concrete crushes at one very important number set by the code. What is this number? If we're saying that this is the compression side, then this number up here is a fixed number, 0 0.003 strain. The strain in the concrete at crushing is 0 0.003. What is the strain over here? I don't know yet. It's the strain of the steel. Now, when does that happen? At failure. So I kept pushing my beam under bending until something happened. What happened? Crushing of concrete or yielding of steel. This is what the basic two components. One of them will fail. So to fail my section, I'm failing one of them. Either failing the concrete in compression or I'm failing the steel. Again, this needs to be in front of this. I'm failing the steel in tension. Okay, so I've yielded it all the way until it's gone. But in both cases, I will assume that at crushing my crushing strain of the extreme compression fibers, those are the extreme compression fibers, the crushing strain equals to 0 0.003. Very simple and very important. Before we proceed, we need to check or understand some notations. What are those notations? Is what we're, what we're going to use in our design. We'll use some abbreviations for different things. So we said that the section height will be called H. Now, the distance between the extreme compression fibers, now here is, this one is under compression, and that side is under tension, right? And we said that those steel bars over here will not be working with me. Why? Because I'm assuming singly reinforced section. Even though those two bars are very strong, right? they're steel. They're under compression, yes. They're taking compression, yes. But I'm not assuming them working with me. We will say that only concrete works in the compression side, and I will assume that the tension steel is only working with me. So that's why it's, it's called singly reinforced, singly reinforced. Now the distance from the com compression side all the way at the extreme fibers to the last layer, the centroid of the last layer, is called DT, so D tension. And the distance from the extreme fibers to the centroid of all the layers, however the number is, is called D. And D is a very, very important factor. So the distance between the very last compression side and my tension T is D. What do, you, what do you mean by my tension T? I will assume that my tension T is applied at the centroid of all the layers underneath. Somebody will ask, what if I have a layer of four and above it a layer of two? That means the layer, this, the CG or the centroid of all of these will be towards the layer of four bars. I agree, but for simplification, we will just take it the midpoint between all the layers. So if you have two layers, we'll be exactly in the middle between them. If we have three layers, it will be exactly on the layer of the middle. So it's very simple. We don't have to complicate things. There's already a lot of assumptions in our calculations. And then we said that our width is B of the section. Uh, the, uh, again, we agreed on D and DT. The stirrup size is DST, that's D stirrup. And the bar size, the diameter, is DB. Now, all of the reinforcement is AS. So A1 plus A2 plus A3, all the layers added together is considered area steel, AS. Now the clear distance <coughs> or the clear spacing between the bars is called CS. What is CS? Side to side. Okay, and we will know how important CS is. This is the explanation of all the abbreviations. Now, what's the concrete cover? The concrete cover is the very last layer that is outside the stirrups, and it's meant to protect my concrete, uh, my steel cage. It, it's meant to protect the steel from environment, from corrosion, from weather, all of these things. 
So it is specified based on the code. The code gives you the minimum concrete cover for different structural members. So members that are exposed to earth and weather are different than members that are not exposed, like beams and columns. Okay? If it's permanently uh, exposed to earth, like footings, then you'll have to put some extra value, value for the uh, concrete cover. This is the specification of ACI 318 2014 for various structural members depending on their exposure to, uh, to the weather outside. Now CS, we talked about CS and we said that CS is simply the clear spacing between the bars. So if I have my stirrup looking like this, and then my bars are inside here, that distance here is my CS. Why is it important to keep it not less than a certain value? It is very important to keep it wide and big enough for the concrete to flow during construction. So I want my concrete to go through the steel. So I cannot, I cannot make the distance between my bars too close that ends up taking, um, holding on aggregates and congesting and causing honeycomb, right? So in this case, you will have to uh, keep it at a minimum distance. What's the minimum? It's the larger of these three. What are those? DB, which is the diameter of the bar, 25 millimeters, which is two and a half centimeters, right? And four over three D aggregate, which is the biggest size of your aggregate. So I want to make sure that the biggest aggregate size can pass through this without being interrupted or held between the bars. Make sense? Now the CS I calculated from my section needs to be bigger than CS minimum. And this here is the provision in the code that tells me where to get CS minimum from. How do we calculate DT? Simply, I have a beam here. It is this distance. Now, where is this distance coming from? It's the H, the whole thing. H. This is H. Minus the concrete cover. Minus D stirrups. And then minus half a bar. So it's H minus this distance. Okay? So it is H minus concrete cover minus D stirrup minus half a bar. Now you can get this DT. Now when is D equal to DT? When I have a single layer. If I have one single layer, then DT equals D. If I have more than a layer, then I start subtracting until I go to where the center of all the layers are to get my D. So you have to look at the section before you decide is D equal DT or it's DT minus the distance of the centroid of steel to the closest thing. Let's take this quickly. If I have, for example, I have another layer here, then my D goes to the center of all four layers. So this becomes my D. So in this case, it will be H minus concrete cover, minus D stirrup, minus full bar, minus half of the distance between the two bars. And normally the distance between the two bars is taken as a spacer of 25 millimeters. Normally the spacer between the upper layer and the lower layer is a 25 millimeter spacer. So in this case, you need to find where the centroid of all the section rebars and get it. Now, how do I calculate the CS? I simply go over the section from the width. So I'm looking at the section now. This here is my stirrup. And then this here is my bar. 
right? So I'm subtracting B. I subtract from B two covers. Here's one, two. And then two stirrup sizes. Here's one, two. And then all the bars, one, two, three. So the bars times N divided by the number of spacings. And normally the number of spacings is the number of bars minus one. So it's simply B minus two covers and DT, DST from the sides minus N of the bars, number of the bars times DB divided by N minus one. That number needs to be bigger than or equal to CS minimum. As I said, there will be tables that we use later on in the course, and those tables make life very easy. It will tell you the maximum number of bars of any size within any stem size, within any B. Those are the most commonly used bars in beams. Now when it comes to girders of bridges, you can go much higher. When it comes to really small structures, it's okay to use smaller sizes, but those are the most commonly used bars within beams of regular size buildings. Now getting into the actual behavior under bending. Now the purpose here is to calculate MN. And what is MN? We said it's the capacity. Now we will multiply MN by, by phi. But to calculate the capacity, we need to understand what is the capacity. The capacity is the moment applied on the section at failure. It's the moment in which the section fails in flexural uh, when it is reached. Okay, very simple. So I have, I have a a column like this, I pushed it until failure under bending. That bending that caused exactly the failure is MN. So in this case, what am I looking for? I'm looking at failure point. So if I'm looking at failure point, I have to consider that my strain in concrete equals to 0 0.003. Simple, very simple. And we have to consider compatibility. So we have to consider that C equals T. And then coming to the equilibrium, that MN is already equal to the applied moment, MU, right? And that MN will be equal to the couple that was caused by these two forces. So those two forces will cause this couple. You see there's a couple here. And that couple is what's re what is resisting. That couple equals to simply any of the two numbers, C or T, multiplied by the distance between them. So the goal of our chapter of this part of the concrete is to find this value, C or T times the distance between them. Once I found this, it's equal to MN. Let's now see, where, see what C and T are and where they come from. We said C is the compression force in concrete, T is the tension force in steel. Now to understand where we get C and T from, let's start loading a beam gradually, from zero all the way up to failure. So you understand how we got this. Remember with me this fact. Do you remember that concrete had this stress strain curve? And that stress strain curve ended at 0 0.003, and the maximum value here was F prime C. So if I slightly loaded my beam, the upper part that is subjected to compression is over here. That upper part is subjected to compression, right? I will take the very first part of the curve and apply it to it. So the very first part of the curve was what? Was this part. So I will say that it was the linear part. I just loaded the beam with a very small moment that I'm early here in this side of the curve. Remember that I have to take this side 
and flip it to put it in here. So that zero here is this zero. And that highest compression at the extreme compression side is this value. Now going from A to B, where I loaded it to higher stress levels, I will transfer from this point to a higher point. So this higher point will go somewhere here, all the way until it reaches F prime C, right? So imagine I reached F prime C. In this case, my F prime C will be the maximum point, and I have some curve here. And that curve is the same as that backbone here. So this value from zero to the strain at F prime C is this value to the strain at F prime C. Simple, everybody understands. Now let's say that I keep loading it more. What will happen is I will take this whole shape. That's what's gonna see, what we're gonna see in the next slide. At the highest level, now at failure, I'm expecting to see the full stress strain curve of concrete here in the compression side. I want to think this compression curve. So that curve that I've seen over here is applied over there. Okay? Now, for simplicity, we are designers. We cannot deal with curves. Remember what happened to the stress strain curve of steel? We idealized it to two lines. For the same concept, we will try to idealize this curve, but we cannot really just use two lines. We will convert it into a stress block, and that block will be a rectangular block. So think of this. I have two problems. I have to have this area this area equivalent to a triangle or, or a rectangle, okay? I have to have the same area because that area will constitute my force. The area will be converted to a force. And at the same time, I need the line of action of C to be exactly in where it was. Why? Because this distance is important. I will use this distance in calculating my moment. So I need the C to stay exactly where it was. Do we think that this C here is placed exactly in the midpoint of this line? The answer is no. Why? Because the curve starts with zero and it has this hump towards the end. So the C will be towards the end more than here, which means I will have to have an equivalent block that doesn't really start from the zero. I will have to leave some room and make my block a little bit above. So I will convert this litter, this uh, lowercase c into a lowercase a by multiplying it by some number less than one. So when I have my block, my block is actually a little bit above the neutral axis. In this case, my distance is the same. So to be able to get the uh, line of action of C where it should be, we had to convert this lowercase c into a lowercase a by multiplying it by beta 1. And we will know what beta 1 is coming in the next slides. And it's important to keep C in the same place to be able to use the same arm. This arm is what we will use in calculating mn, where mn equals c or t times the distance. We also talked about C or T as a value is equal to the volume of the stress block. So the volume of this stress block is in fact those three values multiplied, 0.85 F prime C A times B. So this gives me the C and the T is equals to uh, area of steel times the stress in the steel. If any of them is multiplied by the distance between them, this gives me the nominal value of the moment. It's very simple. 
to understand and to comprehend. The challenge now that we have is, what is the value of fs? And how do we get the fs from? And then what's the relation between fs as a value and c? Because the change in c, the change of where the neutral axis is, makes a difference of what the value of fs is, because my strain makes a difference whether I yielded the steel or not. <clears throat> Now the compressive force equals to this formula. A is the equivalent stress block depth. And lower case C is the distance from the extreme compression side to the neutral axis. I multiply C times beta one to get A. What is beta one? By research, they found that that stress block makes a distance difference depending on how much my F prime C is. So for low F prime C's, it's 0.85. For medium, we use a transition equation between 0.85 and 0.65. And for high F prime C's, it's equal to 0.65. And then T is the tensile force carried by the steel equals to ASFS. And we said FS depends on how my steel state is. Is it yielded? Then it's equal to F yield. If it is not yielded, that means before yielding, it will be equal to, using Hooke's law, the steel modulus of elasticity times the strain in steel. How do I get the strain of steel? I simply use compatibility of strains, because I know that always at failure, this is 0 0.003, and then take a straight line down to get my stress in steel. Very simple procedure that we will follow. Now let's talk about the three types of failure because it's very important to understand these three types of failure before we proceed. We said that we are applying this high force until failure. At one point, that section here that got a big crack will have one of two things. Either I crush the concrete first or I yield the steel first or both of them happen together. How do I know? I simply know by drawing this curve at failure. If this is 0 0.003, now I'm thinking, what happens down here? Is this F yield or bigger than F yield or did not reach F yield? So if it's exactly F, F yield, it's exactly strain of yielding, it is the balance point where both of them happens together. Crushing happened exactly at the time my yield, my steel yielded. If both of them, because I keep increasing, increasing until this reached 0 0.003, and then I stop. At the reach of 0 0.003, is the steel yielded, or did it just reach yielding, that's balance, already yielded before I reach 0 0.003, that means tension controlled, or did not even yield, it's much less. So I have those three states. If I call the red one, the black one, and the blue one, think about those three values. The red one will be the balance point. The blue one will be the one where I have ductile failure, tension control. Steel yielded before concrete crushed. And then the black one, which is this one, that means my steel did not reach yielding, which means I have so much steel, think about this, I have so much steel that I will not even reach yielding, and I will force the concrete to crush. This will be concrete crushing happened before the steel yields. Now the difference between them is a big difference in the mode of failure. Because if I yielded the steel, and concrete is not crushed yet, that means I will see a lot of signs of failure. Signs of failure is good. It is more favorable type of failure to fail with ductile behavior, where I see cracks, I see warnings, I let people run, where brittle failure, you don't have this chance. So the sudden failure is not a favorable failure. That's why the fee value will be different. And we will see this later on coming towards the end of this chapter. 
So those are the three types of failure. At epsilon c equals 0 0.003, if I'm yielded, it's tension controlled. We call this tension <coughs> controlled. If it's a brittle failure, that means I reach 0 0.003 while my steel strain is less than yielding, this is compression control. And if it's a balance failure where both of them happen exactly at the same time, this is balance. So the balance is one, the compression control is two, and the tension control is three. Those two pictures will explain what we mean by yielding before crushing or crushing before yielding. <clears throat> if you look at this picture, you will see that already the concrete is crushed, right? The concrete is already crushed. You, see, you can see that the top fibers are gone. But before they crush, there's a lot of cracks underneath. Where those cracks came from, my steel is yielded. There's a lot of elongation. While in the second picture, the crushing happened up on top, but you don't see any signs of steel yielding underneath. There's no cracking, there's no excessive deflection. I don't like this. Why? Because there's no signs of failure. It's just very abrupt, very sudden. And you will hear a big crack. While for this one, it was excessive deformation, plenty of cracks, a lot of energy absorption. This is very good for impact loads and for seismic loads and wind loads. <clears throat>